Libya figures into Bible prophecy in the book of Daniel and in Ezekiel chapter 38. In both sections, it is to do with the time of the end. In Ezekiel, the confederacy that joins Rosh is described to us as Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Tagarma of the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. And that's chapter 38, verses 5 to 7. In the parallel section in Daniel 11, the cohorts of the king of the north are described similarly. We read in verse 43, But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Well, who are the Libyans? Ezekiel's Libya is the ancient nation of foot in the modern day form. They trace their origins back to the people of Ham in Genesis chapter 10, where we read in verse 6, And the sons of Ham were Cush and Mizraim and Phut and Canaan. Well, Canaan we are familiar with. Sudan and Ethiopia comprise the area of ancient Cush today. Mizraim is the ancient name of Egypt, and Phut is what we know today as Libya, albeit a larger tract of land. Throughout the Bible, they are depicted as a warlike people, often confederate with the Ethiopians. We read in Jeremiah, in chapter 46 and verse 9, Come ye up, ye horses, and rage ye chariots, and let the mighty men come forth, the Ethiopians and the Lydi Libyans that handle the shield, and the Lydians that handle and bend the bow. Ezekiel also describes them as men of war, a warrior people. In chapter 27, verse 10, They of Persia, and of Lud, and of Phut, which is Libya, were in thine army, thy men of war. They hanged the shield and helmet in thee, and set forth thy comeliness. Nahum goes on to describe them as mercenaries as well, in chapter 3, and verse 9. Ethiopia and Egypt were her strength, and it was infinite. Put and Lubim were thy helpers. Well, Nahum mentions they are associated with the Lubim. This is the same word used in Daniel when he describes the Libyans. They appear to be a, from a similar region and again are seen in the Bible as a warlike people who utilize chariots and horsemen. We read of them in Second Chronicles 12 and verse 3 with 1,200 chariots and 3,000 horsemen, and the people that were without number that came up to him out of Egypt, the Lubims and the Sukims and the Ethiopians. Chapter 16, verse 8 also says, Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? And so it's no surprise to find this people marching in stride with the king of the north, interested in getting in on the action in Israel in the latter days. Well, when we consider Libya throughout history, we find that Libya was ruled by the Carthaginians. These were Phoenicians that established an empire there following the decline of the ancient nation of Tyre. It was sieged by Nebuchadnezzar, later subjugated by Cyrus and the Persians, and eventually Tyre was destroyed by Alexander the Great. Carthage and Rome battled for control of Sicily during the Punic Wars, made famous by Hannibal's exploits in Europe. Carthage eventually fell to the Romans in about 146 BC and ceased to be a major power, becoming a Roman client state under the name of Libya. Libya was ruled by the Romans until Gaiseric's Vandals conquered them in about 435 AD, and it remained Christian until it was conquered by the Arabs under the banner of Islam in the 7th century. It was taken by the Ottomans in 1551 and remained such until it was conquered by the Italians in 1911, finally gaining independence in 1951 under a man named King Irdis. Well, Colonel Gaddafi, inspired by Egypt's Nasser, overthrew the King Irdis of Libya in 1969 and established a republic and later a socialist state ruled by his decree. He was an Arab nationalist who nationalized the oil industry in Libya and used its revenues to build up the military. Libya has the 10th largest oil reserve in the world. While well, Gaddafi was a strong supporter of the Palestinians, funding Black September who carried out the massacre of the Israeli athletes at the Olympics in West Germany in 1972. 
Gaddafi uh, allied himself with the Soviet Union in the late 1970s and 80s. He was responsible for the Pan Am airline bombings over Lockerbie in Scotland in 1988. Libya has remained a pariah state and on the list of states sponsoring terror since or until 2006. For a while, Gaddafi had both a nuclear and chemical weapons program. In 2011, the Arab Spring erupted across the Middle East and Libya was plunged into civil war, and NATO supported the rebels with a no-fly zone and targeted strikes. By September, Gaddafi was on the run and he was killed on October the 20th. Since then, Libya has had two governments, one in the east called the House of Representatives, and one in the west called the General National Council, led by Prime Minister Suraj. A deal called the Skirat Agreement was supposed to unite them under one house, but this has not materialized as the HOR would not approve it. While the House of Representatives or HOR government in the East and the GNC or the General National Council in the West battle it out, they have also been fighting ISIS simultaneously. Well, the two warring governments have both courted the US. However, the USA has abandoned Libya. According to the Guardian newspaper, the USA were horrified that in the wake of the Benghazi attacks on the US consulate in September 2012, that killed the ambassador and three other Americans. With political fallout in Washington that continues to this day, the Obama administration decided the country was too toxic and walked away." End quote. Well, a vacuum has been created in Libya, similar to the situation in Iraq. The government has been removed, but in its place, anarchy has ensued. The different tribes, once united under a powerful leader, are vying for power. Into this vacuum, radical Islam has arisen as a threat to both sides, and as an opportunity for others to rise to the surface. According to the headlines, a man named Khalifa Haftar is a renegade general who, has been, who is causing upheaval in Libya. The Guardian reported of his exploits back in May of 2014. Khalifa Haftar's offensive against the government that replaced Gaddafi, which he accuses of being a haven for terrorists, has been far more successful. It has seen him attack Islamic militias in Benghazi and the parliament in Tripoli. In less than a week, key army units, political parties, and tribal forces have rallied under his banner. On Thursday, tension mounted when a powerful brigade from Misrata deployed in the center of the capital. The renegade general's moves are being closely watched both at home and abroad. Well, at the time, it looked like he was just another tribal leader who would come and go as the Guardian reported. But this week, Libya and Haftar resurfaced in the news headlines, and it is significant why. Haftar, the rebel general, asked Moscow for help in Libya back in June. The Middle Eastern Monitor reported on Tuesday, Haftar was in Moscow in June to discuss weapon supplies, including aircraft spares, and Moscow's potential role in helping broker a settlement in Libya. Last week, Haftar called on the international community to end the arms embargo on Libya, criticizing it for hindering the fight against Daesh, or ISIS. End quote. Well, following the meeting in June, the Russian news agency TASS reported Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov as stating, Libya is an example of catastrophic results of the mindless power politics aimed at changing regimes, an example of a catastrophe that was created by those who flagrantly violated the UN Security Council resolutions on the no-fly zone. Well, this past week, Haftar again met with the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov in Moscow on Tuesday, as Reuters reported. Khalifa Haftar, the military commander of Libya's eastern government, has met Russian Foreign Ministry Sergei Lavrov and he said he was seeking Moscow's help in his fight against Islamic militants at home. Haftar, on his second visit to Moscow since the summer, requested military support from the Kremlin in September, according to Russian media. Well, the article pointed out that Haftar is officially asking Moscow for help. 
It went on to state Haftar, who is aligned with the Eastern Parliament and government based in Tobruk, the HOR, has been fighting a two-year military campaign with his Libyan National Army against Islamic extremists and other opponents in Benghazi and elsewhere in the East. Many suspect he seeks national power. Donning a Russian fur hat as he entered the snow-lashed uh, snow foreign ministry, Haftar told Lavrov he had met Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shurgoy on Monday to tell him about his military needs, end quote. So, government-affiliated general from Libya has gone to Russia to officially ask for Russia's help in fighting a war against Daesh, ISIS, or whatever label one wishes to put on the Islamic group this week. Well, what is interesting is that this whole situation is being blamed by Vladimir Putin on Western interference, helping to remove a leader and plunging a country into civil war. It was under the same circumstances that Russia launched its military operations to support Syrian President Bashar al-Assad last year in the war against terrorists. Russia has placed its support largely behind the Tobruk parliament, as Lavrov stated back in June. We know about the attempts to ignore rather large units of Libyan tribes that have been most effective fighting against IS militants, that have taken root in many parts of Libya, he stated. There is a decision approved by the UN Security Council, the Russian foreign minister said. This is the Chirac Agreement, which was concluded in Morocco at the end of 2015, in accordance with which the so-called government of national unity was established. However, he states, the creation of this government in accordance with the Chirac Agreement must be ratified by a parliament, which will be recognized by the international community as the legitimate parliament of Libya that sits in Tobruk. So Lavrov made it clear that Russia has never abandoned Libya, unlike the USA, and is working to help heal the rift in Libya. He stated, we are convinced that it is necessary to consolidate all the Libyan forces and only then take heed to the requests of the international community that will be put forward by the united Libyan people. The people who remember the Libya-Russia ties have never broken contact with us. We cooperate with them and support them in their aspiration for a nationwide dialogue in ac and accord. Well, this week, Lavrov plays General Haftar and the Lib Libyan National Army, according to TASS. Moscow highly appreciates the role of the Libyan National Army, the LNA, in upholding Libya's independence and territorial integrity. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said on Tuesday, opening talks with LNA commander Khalifa uh, Haftar. We appreciate your role in protecting the country's independence and territorial integrity, the minister said. We can see how deeply you understand the interconnection between the struggle for sovereignty and the need to suppress terrorists. Well, Haftar reiterated that Russia is looking at how it can cooperate with the Libyan National Army to combat terror. He stated that yesterday we had the honor of being received at the Russian Defense Ministry. We discussed quite a few military issues outlining all requirements for combating terrorism. We hope that we will be able to eliminate terrorism with your support, that is Russia, very soon, Haftar added. Well, just how far Russian support for Libya will go is something well worth watching. A Debka file report stated Russia's support was a new Putin move to win a military base in Libya. The report gave detail. It stated that the Libyan general Khalifa Haftar arrived in Moscow Sunday, November 26, with a request for Russian arms and military support for his army. He was welcomed in Moscow, which saw an opening for Russia to gain its first military base in North Africa, according to Debka Files military and intelligence sources. Pre President Vladimir Putin began to envision a second Mediterranean base on the coast of Benghazi, twin to Hememem in Syria's Latakia. This one would accommodate Russian naval as well as air units and be located 700 kilometers from Europe. 
end quote. Well, the report stated, uh, outlined some of the practical aid being offered. It said that Putin is now offering Haftar's army fighter jets, attack helicopters, armored vehicles, and assorted missiles, as well as air support for fighting the Islamic State. The target is the Islamic State, the very same target that Russia is purportedly fighting in Syria. It is going to help protect Libya from that threat. This is in keeping with the words of Ezekiel that identify Libya as an ally of Russia in the time of the end. We read earlier Ezekiel 38 verses 5 to 7, identifying Libya with them with shield and helmet. And it goes on to state that Russia would be prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy bands or, or thy, thy company that are with thee, they're assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. So Russia is to be a guard unto the host that is gathered to it. It has already assumed this role in regards to Iran and Syria, is looking to do so in Iraq, and now appears to be picking up the mantle in Libya. The Debka report went on to point out the significance of Russia's involvement. At all events, Russian planes in Hamimim are capable of covering the 1,500 kilometer distance to Libya, while the Russian carrier, Admiral Kuznevets, is anchored not far away off Syria's Mediterranean shore. Both are therefore available for operations in support of the Libyan general. This would be the first time a Russian aircraft carrier went into action in this part of the Mediterranean. The battles ongoing along the Mediterranean coast this week among the various militias include Hafta's army are in fact a tug of war for control of Libya's oil fields. Libya's oil fields are, oil riches are certainly not absent from Putin's calculations, Debka said. Moscow's assistance in helping his Libyan visitor gain the upper hand in this struggle could augur the first Russian stake in the Libyan oil industry, end quote. So don't forget that Libya's oil fields are the 10th largest in the world. Russia has rebuilt its military on the proceeds from the oil and gas industry, and it is well known that a large part of Russia's global strategy is control of energy. So it will be well worth watching Libya in the months ahead, as Russia may repeat its actions in Syria, rushing to the, the aid of a nation that invites it in to help deal with ISIL. We know the alliance will form up in the end, Exactly how it will happen, we do not know, but it is fascinating to see the moves being made to bring this about right before our eyes. We know for certain that we are living in the time of the end. For the Bible in the News, this has been Jonathan Bowen joining you.